Thank you for tuning into this teaching. We hope this message blesses you. Our mission as Marigold Church is to do anything and everything so that anyone and everyone can encounter the real Jesus. We hope as you listen to this, you encounter the real Jesus. Let him transform your mind, transform your heart, and encounter you today. I knew I wanted to talk about Gideon. The reason I wanted to talk about Gideon was because Several several months ago, back in September, we uh, Marcus and I went to to Dallas, and we were visiting another church over there. and And one of the pastors there began to to speak over, speak over me, began to speak over Marcus, and uh, and and didn't know what we were doing. He didn't know that we were uh, planning the church. He didn't know anything on that. But everything he was saying was like spot on in my spirit. And then uh, just about a month ago. We were doing a, uh, we have a, a church board. We have a, a board, like a legal board that makes uh, decisions and, and kind of oversees uh, just finances and just responsibilities and, and of that kind of nature. Just uh, And so we were meeting and then one of the pastors on the board, um, and at, most of the, the, the board is made up of uh, pastors, other churches or uh, part, people from other ministries and things of that nature. And and so one of the pastors began to speak, and it was so much in line with what was spoken in September, and it just kind of rattled in my head, you know. And so I know a lot of churches will do something where, like, hell, let's let's pick a word for the year. We're, this is our word for the year as a church, or a word as an individual. And I I, I don't mind that. I I. I've done it uh, in the past. I don't do it every year, but I've, I have participated in that. And, uh, you know, I don't see anything wrong with it. I think it's good to kind of have something, you know, kind of like a vision. Because really, it's a, it's a vision. It's a word, but it's like a vision. Hey, this is what I'm going to do this year. And I, I, I wasn't planning on doing that this year. And I, I just was getting in the shower one day, and I was like, I don't know why it was on my mind. I just said, you know, Lord, if I don't really have a word. I don't really need one. I don't really do that, but if you want to give me a word, I'm open to it. Just, you know, just let me know. And, and I uh, just kept ringing this, the word Gideon. Of course, uh, Gideon is a name and uh, recognize the, 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 from the story in the book of Judges. And so I want to just, I started to just speak, uh, like think of what I, what everything I knew about Gideon. Okay. So that's typically what I'll do. I'll, okay. If I'm, if I'm going to speak on a person or something, I'll try to write everything I, I know or think I know. And then I'll go to the scripture and weigh that. Right. Like, okay, what, what lines up and what, is, what is stuff that I just threw in there from whatever, you know, just like, oh, I thought this or, Oh, wait, I'm mixing up this guy with some other guy that in the Bible, something like that. So I began to do that, and I was still stuck, still stuck, and uh, didn't really know where I wanted to go with it, but uh, last night in the wee hours of the morning is usually how I, I do it. I'll stay up real late and, until something comes, and, and finally something started to click last night, and I was able to finalize it. But I want to turn to the book of Judges, if you would, in your Bible, and uh, to the to Judges chapter six, you'll find Gideon is in chapters six, seven, and eight, and uh, I'll give you a kind of a rundown or an overview of of the book of Judges. But first, let me pray. Father, I thank you. First of all, thank you for your presence being here, Holy Spirit. I ask that as people would hear my voice, Father, that they would hear beyond my voice. That Lord, you would speak to each and every one of us in this room by your Spirit. Lord Jesus, that's why you ascended to heaven, because you couldn't be everywhere at once. But Lord, your spirit can, and your spirit can dwell within each and every one of us, and in the room with us, around us. You can be anywhere and everywhere all at one time. So we thank you for that. We thank you, Lord God, that you would speak to our hearts, that you would speak something new, a renewing in our mind. In Jesus' name, amen. So, one of the interesting things about about the Bible compared to most, uh, you know, uh, religious books is the Bible is filled with history. We have a lot of history, but it's not just man's history. It's it's really God's history. It's history from God's point of view. It's his story from his point of view that's how we can have the genesis account which is the very beginning and we have the revelation account the genesis account god only god was witness to that 
but he so he gives us the history of that and God has already seen revelation so he's giving us that he's given us Genesis all the way to revelation it covers from the very beginning of time all the way till time ends and so Judges is that is one of those books. Judges is a history book. In fact, Judges and Ruth are very much one in the same book. Ruth being a continuation of Judges. So when you whenever you see Judges, Judges goes right into Ruth. So Judges is a history and it's written during the time of Saul. So even when it's written, it's written looking back at the past. So Judges is all of Judges. You'll see that it'll, it'll use this phrase, there was not a king. There was not yet a king, or a king was not yet, or uh, this was in the time of the Judges or the prophets. There was not a king. So there was, there's a lot of, of sub, uh, subject matter in there that's, that's pointing to the fact that these things keep happening and there's no king. The people need a king. And so Judges and Ruth are both written by Samuel, who anointed David. So, and you'll see, and we'll, we'll, if I get into, if I have time, we'll, we'll point into this. But Judges is written at the time, or about a time that's, that there's no king, but during a time that there is a king, King Saul. King Saul was not a very good king. And so the people knew it. There was, there was a lot of issues. And so that's why God said, look, Saul, you're out David is in. So Samuel secretly anoints David. And so now there's a process of David coming in. I believe that Judges and Ruth are a part of this process because it's getting the people ready for a new king. This is a book that is out. It's distributed. It's during the King Saul. Like, look at what is happening. We wanted that all this stuff was happening because we didn't have a king. Now we have a king and the same stuff is happening with our new king. Something has to change. And so you'll see where Judges has this cycle, okay? And we'll, we'll, we'll look at that. We've, we've talked about that where, where the things of God are straight and narrow. But, but the things of the enemy, once sin enters in, we have this circular, this downward spiral, this crazy cycle, if you, if you will. So if we look in, in, in chapters 1 and 2, it really sets up for what's going to happen in the rest of the chapters, okay? So in chapters 1 and 2, it talks about the compromises of God's people, okay? One of the compromises was they were allowing evil people to live in that land. Now, the people of Egypt, or the people of God lived in Egypt for 400 years, right? All right, that was a judgment. That was a judgment on the people, right? So now, they're, but it's giving, it's giving these wicked people to even take their wickedness even further, to bring it to its fullest, to where it's, they, can got, they cannot get any more evil. So God, in his mercy, allows these people to get more and more and more evil. Finally, he says, okay, this is enough. There is, you're at the point of no return. And so at this point, he has uh, the, the, his chosen people to go in, right, to go in and take the land. Now, the problem is they allowed a, they allowed a lot of people to live. The idea was you come in and you wipe everyone out, which sounds harsh, but it's the judgment of God. It sounds harsh unless you measure it in the light of his mercy for 400 years. Now he's just dropping the hammer, right? And so, but, but they allow the enemies to live, especially in the valleys. There's a lot of people in the valleys that they're like, you know what? They're down there. They're not really bothering us. It's okay. It's a compromise. So anytime you have a compromise in your life, it will come back and bite you. This is coming back to bite the people of Israel. And there's this cycle of it over and over and over. When we read about Judges or, or when we read about Gideon, it's in the time of the Midianites. The Midianites are the people that are giving them all this, uh, this, this rough time. They're coming in. They're stealing their crops. As soon as they, they harvest something, they come in. They steal it. They're overwhelming them. They're taking things. They're, they're just they're overwhelming. They allowed it. Because that's the thing is when you allow compromise, compromise is never stagnant. Compromise is always growing. 
So you let in, oh, well, we're just going to let this one family in. They're down there in the valley. They're, before you know it, there's a million of them. Because you're, you're, what you compromise will, will multiply. So if that's in relationships, some relationships you should have killed, it's going to come back and bite you. Some attitudes, some sins, addictions, habits. If any of those things, any of those compromises, they'll come back and they'll bite you and they'll bite you tenfold, a hundredfold, a millionfold, whatever that is. Another thing that they compromised in was marriage. Okay, so just because the people were evil doesn't mean they looked evil. They looked kind of cute. So they began to marry outside like, oh, well, she's too pretty to be evil. No, nope, she's evil. She's still evil. I heard someone say one time, if you marry a child of the devil, you're going to have problems with your father-in-law. And it's, it's so true in this time. Okay? So they were unequally yoked. And it wasn't about a race. It wasn't about, uh, uh, you know, this ethnicity or any of that. It was they were unbelievers. They, they had idols. They worshiped a different God. So they were unequally yoked. The next, we're going to go to, that's in chapters 1 and 2, kind of introduce that. Chapters 3 through 16 really just introduces the conduct of the people of the time. And there's this cycle going on. There's a cycle. First, it starts off with violation. They are violating the law. Okay, they're violating the law of God. They know the law of God and they're violating it. They're sinning against God. Okay. When they sin against God, there's a hand that's lifted. And so then they are occupation by the enemy. So it goes from violation of the law to occupation. So from violation to occupation. So now they're being overrun by the enemies. They finally get enough of this. This goes on years, decades sometimes. And then they begin to give out a supplication. They begin to cry out to the Lord. Lord, rescue us. We're being overtaken. This is too much. So then God raises up a judge, and there's liberation. Now, the liberation comes from God, but he uses these judges. Now, when we talk about these judges, we're not talking about, you know, someone with a, a robe and a gavel. That's not what it is. It's basically like a troubleshooter. God sends someone to go assess the issue. Okay, here... They're, they've been, they've been uh, tormented. They're crying out. Go assess the situation. All right, now you're going to handle it, or God's going to handle it, but he's going to use one of these people to do it. The problem is, if you look at this crazy cycle inside of Judges, is after the liberation, everything goes back to violation. Okay, either with the next generation that they forget the fear of the Lord, they forget what God has done, and so now it goes back to getting back in that rut. Like when have you ever, if that ever happened to you, God rescued you from something, and then you're like, oh, cool, I'm out of this, and then there you go, right back to it, right? So then in chapter 17, and so we're going to see actually in the middle of that is where we're going to see Gideon. He's right in chapter 6, 7, 8. So then chapter 17 through 21, we're going to see just absolute corruption. We have idolatry and immorality, okay? So you see this crazy cycle going throughout Judges. And this constant thing is we need a king. We need a king. The one, and look, that's why we needed a king. Because there was never anyone to, for that second generation to say, hey, remember what the Lord did. He's the one that rescued us. The only reason we're free right now is because he rescued us. There was never someone to, to set that in place. And so people are saying, we want a king. We want a king. Instead of looking to God, and he says, okay, I'll grant you a king. They, he gives them Saul. Saul they were approved of because he was tall. He was handsome. He was a great politician. And they paid the price for it. Because then from there... Saul begins to oppress the people. So they were oppressed by the enemy. Now they're oppressed by their own king, overtaxed, overworked. 
And then we go into Ruth. Ruth is 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 not a separate book. It's it's written separately, but it's almost kind of like Luke Acts. Like Luke, it kind of goes right into Acts. Luke, same author, just, okay, this is a continuation. Okay, this is why Jesus was here. Now this is what happens after this Luke Acts. So now we have this Judges Ruth. So now here Ruth, it, where, whereas Judges was about a lot of people, it was about a whole nation. Ruth is about a few people. It's about just a very few people that come in. And Ruth is the answer to Judges. But here, let's get back to Gideon in Judges chapter 6. So in Judges chapter 6, you'll see an angel visits Gideon. So the Midianites have overtaken the people of, of uh, uh, right there where, where Gideon is. And they've overtaken them. And so here we have concerning the Midianites in, in verse, uh, ch- chapter 6, verse 12. An angel comes to Gideon and says, The Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. And so what, what he's doing in this time, what Gideon is doing in this time, he's threshing wheat. Okay, he's threshing wheat, but he's doing it in hiding. He's doing it in a dark place because he's hiding from the enemy. Because if they see, wait a minute, this guy's got something, they're going to come after him. Okay, so he's hiding. So Gideon is very fearful. And, and, and the angel says, hey, I, I've got an assignment for you. This is what God wants you to do. But Gideon's response is not like, yeah, let's go do it. His response is, but I'm the least. I'm the least in my family. And by the way, my family is the least in in our tribe. We are the least, and I am the least of the least. But Gideon nevertheless says, you know what? You're the angel of the Lord. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a sacrifice for you. He goes, he gets a lamb, he, 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 he prepares this sacrifice. The angel tell, tells him to set it on a stone, and then it's consumed by fire. So right then and there, he built an altar to the God, altar to God, and then that very night, the angel tells him to do something else. He says, "Your dad has an Asherah pole. All right, it's an idol. I want you to tear it down." Well, being fearful and being still afraid, he tears it down at night. He's like, "I'll do it. With, you know, just kind of. I'll still obey you, but I don't want nobody to see me obeying you, right?" And so in the night, he tears down the, the altar to Baal, or Baal, 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 is how is it, Baal, Baal, I just always say Baal, but it's Baal, that belonged to his father. Now, it's his father's idol, okay? And he takes the wood of it, and he offers a burnt offering. He uses it as firewood. From there, they want to kill Gideon, but his father steps up and says, wait a minute, if Baal is so great... Why doesn't he just defend himself? And that was his dad's idol. So by Gideon stepping up, it puts his dad in a position to step up. So sometimes God's going to use you and your family. And sometimes you're looking for your family to step up and he's saying, yeah, they're going to, but I'm, I'm, you got to be obedient to me first. From there, I can use you. From there, I'll work it out. So from there, he's on this high. He's like, man, I'm, you know, I got God behind me. I'm going to go gather up these people. I'm going to gather up an army. So he sends words to some of the tribes. And so he gathers 32,000 men. But he's still not sure because he knows he's got a big army to, that he's going he's gonna to go against. So he's got 32,000 men, but he's still like, God, I need you on this. But I need a sign. Let me know if this is, if this is you. And so he goes through the, the first sign concerning the fleece and the dew. He puts that out. And he says, okay, okay, please don't be mad at me. This is a, another day goes. You answered me. First you burnt the offering. Then you did this with, with, the, with the, the Asherah pole. And, and now the, this thing. But can I ask you one more time? Can you please do the same thing with the fleece and the dew? But just time, reverse it. Flip it. So... God in his mercy and super, super patience says, okay, okay. So he does it. He gives him a second sign. So now we have Gideon with his 32,000 men, and he's going to go up against 135,000 men, right? 135,000. So God, but God tells him, you have too many people. 
You've got too many people. I need you to cut your army down. I need you to send 22,000 of your people back home. So now Gideon has 10,000 people. He has 10,000 men to face 135,000. So 10,000, he takes them. He says, God says that you, you, even the 10,000 is too many. Go down to the brook and you're going to have them drink and you're going to separate the men based on how they drink the water. All right? Now, the way they, the way they, there was two ways that the men drank. The first one was they would get on their knees and, and kneel at the water and dip their head face first and splash the water up. Either that or, or sticking their face in the water itself and drinking it, just sucking it up, not like a vacuum. You just suck up the water. The other way was to lap like a dog. And basically, they would squat down and just cup their hand and, and splash the water in their mouth. Now, I was looking at the way a dog drinks water. Have you ever seen a dog drink water and had seen it in slow motion? It was, it's really interesting. The way, when they're drinking it real fast, it looks like they're cupping their tongue forward, right? Like, like they're licking it like that. And I have my dog, Kiko. I love, I love having a dog, Kiko, because I'm always talking about him at church. But, but he, he's, a, he's a golden doodle, and he's big, and he, and he comes. He's, you know, furry and everything. And so he'll come with his, with his hair all, you know, curly and everything. He comes after drinking water, and it's dripping down his face, dripping down his chest. He is, he's just, he's like just, he just, he's just getting it, right? He's getting it down. And so what happens is their tongue actually curls backward and it creates this little cup. So when they dips in, they're, they're, they're pulling it in, they're throwing it in their mouth. They're throwing the water in their mouth. That's why after a dog drinks, it's dripping off their chin and, and their, and their, their neck and everything else. So that's how these men were drinking. But here's the thing. All the time that they're drinking, they're fully alert. They're fully alert of everything going on. They don't take their eyes off of anything. They're not concerned. They're not concerned with everything. So they're drinking it, and they're, but they're looking out. They're looking out. Now, there was only 300 of those men that, that did that, that lapped like a dog, that, that scooped up the water like a dog. And so those, three, those 300 men, God says, those are the men. Those are the men that you're going to take with you. And these are the men that I'm going to use to defeat this army. So now we have 300 men, or, and plus Gideon, 300 men against 135,000 men. That's 450 to 1. All right, 450 men to one. Now, there's things that I want to point out about the 300 men. All right, just I want to just think, let's just think about this. You put yourself in the moment, right? There's 300 men. There's, there's, these were the things that I was thinking about them. Number one, these men were dripping with water. When they're, when they're drinking, they're not, they're not thinking about how good they look drinking water. They're not just worried about just themselves. They're indulged in this moment. I, I got to get it for me. I'm at the brook. This is my chance. And they're dripping with water, right? They're splashing it up in their face. They're drinking what they can. They got it running down. No, it's not the most economical way to drink. But that's how they're drinking. They're, not, they're thinking about the men around them. The next thing I was thinking of is they were more concerned with keeping a lookout than they were with keeping a look. How great would a church be that they were more concerned with looking out than how they looked? See people, oh man, yeah, man, style. Oh, you got my shoes on point, got this. Oh, yeah, yeah. Ooh, man, I'm ready for church. You haven't read your Bible in six months, but you ready for church. You got the look, 
But who are you looking out for? The other thing is they didn't follow the crowd. I was looking at this. So there's 10,000 men out of the 10,000, only 300. So that's 33 to 1 ratio, right? And I was thinking, so on average, for every one person that just decided to drink like this, they watched 33 others drink properly. And they didn't go again. They, they went completely against what others were doing. And I, you'd have to think, these men are going against, Gideon is saying, hey guys, it's us, us 300, we're going up against 135,000. You have to be a little nuts to say, let's do it. There's People that are a little nuts are really good for the kingdom of God. Just a little. If you're completely nuts, you're useless. But if you're a little nuts, you don't mind going against the crowd. You don't mind sticking out. You don't mind being the only one. In your, let's say there's 33 people at work. You don't mind being the only one that does it the way you do it. For some, they might have seen 10 people. For others, they may have seen 70 people. But, they're, but they're, they're going against everything that's going around them. And they stand out differently. And God says, that's, that's what I can use. They're just crazy enough to, to do this. They're just crazy enough to listen to me. Gideon wasn't a great leader. He was scared out of his mind. But they believe something. They believe something about him. He's just crazy enough. He might just do this. Now Gideon is still afraid. Okay, He's going to battle and he's still afraid. So he, the God, God tells him, go ahead and take a servant. You're still afraid. Go down and take a servant down with you in the valley. So the, the, the Midianites are down in the valley. And so here you have Gideon. And they're going to circle around them. But right now, they're just, they're just kind of grouped. They're on the outer edge. And he says, go down to the valley. I want you to hear something. So I want to read that real quick. In, in Judges chapter 7, In verse 13 and 14, it says, When Gideon came, behold, a man was relating a dream to his friend. And he said, Behold, I had a dream. A loaf of barley bread was tumbling into the camp of Midian, and it came to the tent and struck it so that it fell, and turned it upside down so that the tent lay flat. So that's the dream. That's the dream that the man had. Now he's telling the dream to his friend. This is what his friend says. This is nothing less than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. God has given Midian and all the camp into his hand. So you have the dream and then the friend interprets the dream. Gideon overhears this. As he's spying in, he overhears this, and he says, aha, it gave him confidence. Even they believe that we're going to do this. The, the reason I, I wanted to share this word was only because as, as the pastor of Marigold Church, right? as the under-shepherd, as we talked about last week. I understand, if you look in this room, we are a ragtag bunch in here. Hey, 
And I, I, I use the word bunch very, very liberally. We're a ragtag few. But I promise you, in 2021, you'll stick this out with this ministry. You are going to see the hand of God move. I boldly declare that. Because I'm just crazy enough to believe God. And I hear the whispers of the world. And they know something's coming. Well, they don't know who's going to bring it to them. And that's the people of God. That is the remnant of God. Those that are sticking it out. Even when it's hard. Even when it's difficult. Even when you want to give up. Even when it's unsurmountable. 450 to 1. And Gideon was still afraid. I'm still afraid. So when you see me moving forward, it's not for a lack of fear. But I know God. And I know what he can do. I know what he can do with one. You see, God chose to use 300. He could have used three if he wanted to. God, God is not concerned with the numbers. He's concerned with the faithful. Now, immediately after hearing this, what is his response? Gideon's response is not, yeah, we got this. I'm on it, boys. This is all about me. I knew it. I knew I could. Do he bows down in worship to God immediately after hearing the word. He gives thanks to God for the victory before it's even happened. He's still, the odds are still 450 to 1 against him. All he knows is God's word and he's heard a rumor. That's it. That's what he's going on. So Gideon splits the group up into three groups of 100. And he sends 100 this way, 100 that way, 100 another way. And they're spread out. Now, they're armed with two things on, on their hands. One is a trumpet. It's a, it's a horn. It's a ram's horn. Okay, we'll just call it, this is, it's a trumpet. It's what they would bl blow a horn. But it was a literal horn, a ram's horn. That's a shafar, right, shafar? The other thing they had was a torch, but it was covered in a jar. I was trying to look up to see how big the jar was. I couldn't find anything with the jar, you know, with that, you know, that they could tell us how big the jar was. That the word they use for jar is, is made for different sizes of jars. But obviously it was big enough to hide the light inside of it. But it was light enough for them to carry. And so Every man had their own horn, their own trumpet, and their own torch. Every man, all 300 of them. And then he gives them a sign. They break the jar to reveal the torch. They blow the trumpet, and all hell breaks loose on the camp. They begin to kill each other. In such terror. Now why would they do that? Because one horn represented a flank or a, a part of the army. So when they heard 300 of them, they thought they were outnumbered. Because they thought for every horn that they're hearing, that's a whole troop of men behind that horn. Because that's how they guided back then. There was no radios. There was no, you know, hey, breaker, breaker, one niner, take a left. No, there was none of that. It was, you go by the horn. Horn said, go get them. A certain horn said, retreat. This was a horn saying, let's attack. 300, 300 of them. 
Now let's look. I want to look at two things. I want to look at the trumpet and the torch. A trumpet is our worship. Everyone has to come with their own worship. And when I say worship, I'm not talking music. I'm talking your life worship. You worship all week long. You worship something or someone. You worship by the way you treat your spouse. You worship by the way you treat your children. You worship by what you give to. You worship by how you act at work. You worship by how you speak. Your life is an act of worship. This was a holy worship. And worship has a sound to it. So when we come collectively, the only thing different between your individual worship and your corporate worship is music. Because music is a unifier, right? We come into, we go to a concert and we're in unity because, because the songs, they unify us, right? We get unified behind a song. But that is, that is, just, the, that is just the beginning of the week of worship. Sunday is just the beginning of worship. This is just our sound. But each and every one, is, one of us bring our own sound to the worship. You see, a single trumpet, that's what you hold daily, right? That's a sound of a battle. One trumpet. Charge. One little battle, right? So we each have our battles during the week, don't we? And we, gotta, we have a battle that we have to worship through. So when we come together on Sunday... What are we doing? We're bringing all of our battles to the table, all of our worship to the table. And now we sound the horn together. It's not just a sound of a battle. It's a sound of war. We are going to war. The next thing is the torch. The word. When I thought of that, when I thought of how they were breaking open the jars and revealing the torch, I thought of Psalm 119. I have hidden your word. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. It's been hidden for a time as this to be revealed. And when the jar is broken at just the right time, it symbols something that here now the now the flame comes bursting out of the jar. The light is revealed with a loud crash. When the Holy Spirit so many times when you look in the Bible you'll see a flame or a fire and it's very much representation of the Holy Spirit or God. Everyone carried their own trumpet, but everyone had their own word. No one was waiting for Sunday to get the word. They were getting it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then Sunday coming together. We're bringing the word. No one comes just to church on Sunday hoping to get a cracker and a little bit of wafer and a little bit of juice to get by. No, you feed yourself all week physically. Why would you not feed yourself in the word? So everyone came in with the word. And so you have these 300 torches and these 300 trumpets and it brought chaos to the enemy. The unity of the army brought chaos to the enemy. They began destroying themselves out of the 135,000 men, 120,000 died right then and there at their own swords. 15,000 fled and Gideon and his men pursued those men until every single one of them were dead. 
No more compromise. It reminds me of 2 Kings chapter 6 and verse 8 through 23. You see Elisha. And Elisha is surrounded by the enemy. And the, and, and the servant of Elisha, is, he's scared out of his mind. What should we do? I mean, we're surrounded. What should we do? And Elisha prays and says, God, will you please open this guy's eyes? Show him what I see. So God shows him. The army that was surrounding Elisha was being surrounded. But by an army of angels. It says, in chariots of fire. I don't think it was much different in the time of Gideon. I don't think it was just 300 men. I believe they were surrounded by hundreds of thousands of angels that were doing ready for battle. How else could you explain it? God's called us to do great things, but the only way it'll work in your life, for you personally, is if you carry your own worship and you carry your own word and you bring it with you on Sunday as a celebration saying, look what God has done. Not crawling in saying, what's he going to do for me this week? It's a celebration of what he's been doing all week long. And the, just like when Elisha, I mean, just like when, when Gideon heard the word, he heard the word, he heard the rumors of his victory. What was his response? His response was to worship. That's why today I wanted to, I wanted you to hear the word. I want you to see your victory. When you have the word and you have worship, you are bound to win. But only if you see it through. At any point, if any one of those men would have backed down, they would have met the same fate as their enemy. It's not about getting started in the faith. It's about being a finisher in the faith. There's a lot of people that get started who never put in the time and never put in the work and they get choked out. And then they say, well, I guess it wasn't real. Or that church just didn't feed me. Or that pastor didn't pet me enough. Or someone said something and it hurt my feelings or whatever. Get in the word. What does the word say? They each had to make that choice on their own. So tonight, I just challenge you as we've heard the word, let us worship together. Let's just... Hey, if this message or any of the content that we've been putting out has blessed you and you're wondering how you can partner with us in generosity, there are a couple ways to do that. You can download the PushPay app and you can search Marigold Church and you can give that way. You can also set up reoccurring giving and it's really user friendly. It makes it really easy to give. You can also text Marigold to 77977 and give that way. We believe God moves through a generous heart. And so we would love to see what God does through you as you partner with us and as we walk through this journey together.